we're going to talk about poetic voice today and, uh, and mainly proceed, I think, through a series of close readings after I make a few pontifications about, uh, about, the, about the general nature and really, you know, in, a, in a certain kind of way, the mystery of it. First of all, I just want to say that <clears throat> why do we love poetry? We love poetry because we want to be more alive. We love poetry because we want to be more alive. We want more life. And thinking about it in the context of this particular talk, in terms of voice, I think one of the reasons why we love poetic voice and why we love poetry itself is because, in a certain kind of way, it reenacts the integration of the self, that incredibly difficult, heroic act of holding all our parts and fragments and pieces together, our, our present and our past, our wounds and our, <clears throat> and our triumphs, our wishes and our, our fears, holding them all together, that act of integration. And poetry is also, amazingly enough, capable of embodying and including in, in a poem the disintegrations that we have experienced and that we are experiencing even now. In other words, there are places where a poem will fail to find words, and that failure to find words is itself an eloquence. It's the expressiveness of the inchoate. And there are so many things going on in the field of the poem uh, <coughs> um, for me especially a, a very alive poem. The, more, um, the other overarching assertion I want to make about the nature of poetic voice is that, um, is, is very simple, is that for me, the poem is an embodiment of what the depth psychologists call psyche. It includes the unconscious as well as the conscious, the superego as well as the id, it includes all, and gathers together all these different energies and insubordinations and insurgencies and repressions that go on inside ourselves. <clears throat> we walk around pretending that we are one person, but in fact, you know, if you examine the contents of your minds and feelings, that you are, you know, that you are deeply riven <clears throat> and uh, scattered, as they say, idiomatically. So, <clears throat> the self is a loosely organized kind of uh, alliance, uh, much like the EU, you know. You wouldn't want to <laughs> accidentally have part of yourself just fragment off and float away. And you have to hold it together through a kind of heroic act. Uh, so <clears throat> poetry extends our reach outwards and it also extends and empowers our ability to dive inside. <clears throat> there are so many different ways to describe the structure of a poem or, or the elements of a poem and I'm just going to talk about voice because I've found that the aspect of poems that is most important to me is, in many ways, their voice. Um, and the kind of voice that I like in particular, um, I characterize for this talk as the American voice, but of course it's not, uh, the, it's not the, uh, the, the, the property of, 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 uh, of America at all. But that voice is characterized by a swiftness and a transformability, a kind of mercurial quality that happens in the progress of the poem. In that way, the kind of voice that I want to praise and, and, and the poems I'm going to show you today, <clears throat> they transform swiftly in mood, in temperature, in what they're including in various levels of intensity, various degrees of, 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 of distance, various altitudes from the, from, from the high to the low, from the vulgar to the sacred. Um, I think that Prospero and Caliban should be in any poem, both of them. You know, the, you know, the transcendental and also uh, the rag and bone shop or the heart. Um, so, um, so those are some of my values. It should include, you know, it should, they should include the good news and the bad news about this difficult, it, tragic business of being a human being or pretending to be a human being. Um, <laughs> So, um, so voice, um, we, you know voice, voice is a, a, a very hard thing to, is it the medium or is it the message? It's not actually per se the information that is in a poem, not what a poem is about. It's almost like a medium or a kind of uh, lubricant or a kind of circulatory system that the poem sort of uh, <clears throat> has running through it sort of like a vascular system. And, uh, but it's a deeply, deeply, it's, a, it, it's, it's the element of a poem that is perhaps most um, appealing 
and also achieves a kind of uh, intimacy with us as a reader. Um, what do we believe about a poem that has good voice and what do we disbelieve when a poem does not have adequate voice is what do we want from poetry is we want an adequately complex version of the world, not something that is reductive, not something that has been oversimplified, not something that is, uh, has been uh, uh, dictated uh, according to some kind of thesis or the willfulness of the speaker, not coming from the head merely, but also coming from the gut and the groin. We want a version of the world and a version of, the hu of human nature that is sufficiently complex. And where most poems fail is, they pro is that they provide uh, an inadequately complex version of that. And you could locate that, that, that shortcoming in, uh, in poetic voice, in the element of poetic voice. So, um, so a poem has to be controlled, but not over-controlled. It has to be un, you know, both uh, not over-organized, maybe a little bit under-organized. Um, between uh, between <coughs> um, let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediment and uh, uh, there's a big range. <laughs> and a poem can actually traverse that entire spectrum and include that whole spectrum. Um, so, a heroic act of integration. The, the, the touchstone that I use for thinking about what a poem is in terms of voice and other things I mentioned the other day uh, is, uh, can be found in a poem by Czesław Miloš, the Polish poet, Nobel Prize winner, who says in his poem called Ars Poetica, he says, the purpose of poetry is to show how difficult it is to be just one person. The purpose of poetry is to show how difficult it is to be just one person. In other words, those struggles and conflicts have to be in the surface of the poem, in the surface of the language. They can manifest in any of dozens of ways. Um, you know, um, um, so a self is a community, and from my point of view, uh, so very often is a poem. There's another way to sort of uh, uh, sum up the particular aesthetic that I'm talking about, and is that, and the American aesthetic, which is that a poem includes its own, it includes the process of its making in its surface. In other words, it's not presented as a perfected product, okay? which, see, which, which the, a poem in which the evidence on the page seems to indicate that the maker is a master, uh, knew what the poem was going to be about before it was written, and there is no trace of the struggle of its own making. There are no fingerprints in the clay. No. There is no dirt on the potato. I want a poem that when you, it looks like it was pulled up from the ground and has dirt on it. Um, and so, um, so I want to identify some of the particular kinds of technical, specific techniques that to me uh, 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 make a convincing voice and sort of retain the evidence of that process. So if you look at the front, at the first page of your handout, um, I want to make, I want to show you a poem by the American poet Frank O'Hara, sort of the foremost member of what is known as the, as the New York School of Poets, um, wrote in the 50s and the 60s. This is one of his more famous poems. Um, it's simply called uh, Poem, and it's known as the Lana Turner poem. And um, I want to present this poem as uh, an example and an illustration of the mind in motion, the mind self-correcting, making mistakes, stepping back, revising, going forward, pausing, revising. To me, that's convincing element, that's a convincing dimension of the self in process. Here's the poem. Lana Turner has collapsed. I was trotting along, and suddenly it started raining and snowing. And you said it was hailing, but hailing hits you on the head hard. So really, it was snowing and raining, 
and I was in such a hurry to meet you, but the traffic was acting like the sky, and suddenly I see a headline, Lana Turner has collapsed. There is no snow in Hollywood. There is no rain in California. I have been to lots of parties and acted perfectly disgraceful, but I never actually collapsed. Oh, Lana Turner, we love you. Get up. <laughs> so, in many ways, this is a trifle of a poem. It's, you know, it's light as a feather. And you can see that, um, that, that the, the part of the mind that it dwells in is really very much the surface. It could have been called a, a stream of consciousness poem. One of the ways that you can recognize it as a stream of consciousness poem, and one of the things that makes the voice effective, just to point out a few features of it, is that it has an additive syntax. And, 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 and. Everything is connected. The syntax is not broken into individual grammatical units. And that indicates a certain kind of um, running together of the contents of the psyche. The thoughts and the feelings are sort of trotting along, as the speaker says. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and the thinking is revealed in process. You could even say that there's some, some randomness here. You could even say that it's a sloppy poem. It's a carelessly written poem. But it has the feeling of a voice in the air, in motion. And it emphasizes that product, uh, that aspect of process over product. O'Hara wasn't interested in making a perfect poem, a perfectly tuned poem, a perfectly sort of regimented poem. It's a poem which is very much displayed in self-revising motion. And what is more convincing in a poem than to hear the speaker recognize that she or he needs to correct the line that they just wrote. It's a wonderful, it's a wonderful thing. But what I meant was, no, I take that back. So the little speech gestures like that, I didn't mean to say that. Um, don't take that the wrong way. Little asides like that have an enormous, uh, uh, enormous power of, of verification that you were actually kind of in contact in an intimate way with the speaker of the poem. So I'll just read it again. Lana Turner has collapsed. I was trotting along, and suddenly it started raining and snowing, and you said it was hailing, but hailing hits you on the head hard, so really it was snowing and raining. And I was in such a hurry to meet you, but the traffic was acting like the sky. So there's a little moment, you know, that we have to sort of unpack. Well, that's, a, it's a metaphor. The traffic was acting like the sky. Um, but we don't even pause long enough to digest it or for the metaphor to be made very much of. Maybe the traffic was congested in the way that the sky was congested, and suddenly I see a headline, Lana Turner has collapsed. Now this brings another kind of feature into a poem which I find as a verification of the warm, speaking, lubricated voice, is that suddenly he's seeing something in the environment. He sees the headline, Lana Turner has collapsed. It's even typographically represented as a different kind of level of speech. It's public speech, it's tabloid speech. And so that comes into the poem in, in, in a kind of pronounced way. And then there's a shift in gears, a sort of inconsistency in the progress of the poem. There is no snow in Hollywood. There is no rain in California. Well, Lana Turner is a movie star, so perhaps he's thinking about, about uh, Hollywood for that reason. But the transition the transitional explanation, the connected material, is a bit missing from the poem. This is one of the signatures of an associated poem that is leaping and bouncing along at different velocities at different points in its, in its development. So all of these things, to me, are uh, a kind of excitement, a kind of serotonin or you know, synaptic energy in the poem, which convinces me that, um, that here, is, here is somebody alive, here is something alive. There's also a kind of, uh, what Apollinaire called a kind of simultaneity to the poem. All these things happen at once. They happen with such speed and such momentum that, uh, that, that they're somewhat scrambled together. One of the pleasures of reading such a poem, a poem which contains process and is not a perfected product, is that we are allowed to participate in the poem in the way that we untangle it as we go along. And we all know that this is one of the great um, 
ways that a writer of poems can, uh, can give respect to the reader and allow the reader to participate in the energetic unfolding of the poem. Also, there's, a, a, there's another element which I find characteristic of, of voice in the ways that I want to represent it today, is there's a kind of complicity in the speaker too. I have been to lots of, lots of parties and behaved perfectly disgraceful. That's not even grammatical. He should be saying, and behaved perfectly disgracefully. But that kind of trunca truncation, that kind of colloquial mistake is also part of the, of the imprint you know, of spoken word as opposed to the written word. So, but I never actually, I've been to lots of parties and acted perfectly disgraceful, but I never actually collapsed, oh Lana Turner, we love you, get up. Okay. So, so the personality you hear is a somewhat lightheaded, somewhat superficial, highly charming, rather speedy kind of personality. It's very, very distinctive. I feel that you could take a Frank O'Hara poem and shuffle it up with a bunch of other poets and you would be able to recognize a Frank O'Hara poem out of them. And that's what we want. We want a relationship. This is a highly relational poem and that's another way that, uh, that, that voice sort of succeeds when it succeeds. Um, so the additiveness of the syntax, the grammar obviously has a function here. Um, the self-knowledge of the speaker who knows that he himself is not entirely respectable, the variety of tones uh, from a kind of babbling superficiality to an expression of caring or concern or, or, uh, or compassion, a little bit of showmanship. Um, so, there's, so there's both uh, a kind of art and a kind of artlessness in the poem. Um, so, it is a self-correcting poem that thinks as it goes along. I want to show you another poem now, which, it, um, which exhibits, I think, exa exactly the same virtues, but in a more controlled, uh, uh, a sort of tighter knit way. Um, although, to me, it's every bit as charming and convincing and relaxed. You could say that the O'Hara poem is a little tense. It's a little... Um, it's a little uh, high strung. This is a more relaxed poem. It's called The Geraniums. It's in the lower right hand corner of your, of your, of your poem. And uh, um, Genevieve Taggart, uh, a poet whose name isn't known in the US anymore uh, either, uh, wrote in the 40s and the 50s. My understanding, she's a very interesting poet. I think this is a perfect touchstone poem from which a lot can be learned. Um, uh, and uh, she, was a, she was a bit of a socialist, and she was also uh, a, a bit of a, a sort of mystic, a very interesting poet. Um, so here's her poem, The Geraniums. Oddly enough, it is about geraniums, a flower called geraniums. Um, so um, here it is. And uh, it, I think it combines these two kinds of things about talking about the altitude and the range that a, a poem covers, that it includes the messiness of life and the imperfection of life um, and the impurity of, of, of human beings along with um, a, a sincere sort of uh, elevation of, of, of the value of, of aesthetic beauty. But you'll see where she goes. The geraniums. Even if the geraniums are artificial, just the same in the rear of the Italian cafe, under the nimbus of electric light. They are red, no less red for how they were made. Above the mirror and the napkins, in the little white pots, in the semi-clean cafe where they have good lasagna, the red is a wonderful joy, really. And so are the people who like and ignore it. In this place, they also have good bread. <laughs> so it's a beautiful poem. It really embodies in many ways one of the great achievements of American poetry, which is you know, um, the value, uh, uh, imparting value to the mundane. But you can see that beneath this apparently kind of simple surface, you know, there's actually a pretty complicated 
dialectic going on. That everything in this world is imperfection, imperfect, uh, or tainted, or slightly corrupted, or hybrid, or artificial. These are not real flowers. They're artificial flowers, and yet they're red. They contain the value of beauty and the value that is inherent in the color red, even though the red is made from dye number 17 in a Chinese factory someplace outside Beijing. Right? They are red, even though they are artificial. They are seen in electric light, in an, in a, in an Italian cafe, which, by the way, is only kind of semi-hygienic. They are, they, they, they are in little white pots. The red is a wonderful joy. There's not a bit of insincerity in that sentence that comes late in the poem, where they have good lasagna. The red is a wonderful joy, really. Is that the primary thesis of the poem? It really is. It's the transcendental, it's the transcendental high point of the poem. It's a completely sincere statement, although it's surrounded by a field of what you could call ironic qualifications. Even if the geraniums are artificial, just the same. At, in the rear of the ca Italian cafe, they're not in the foreground, they're in the rear. Under an electric light, they are red, no less red for how they are made. So you can see that this is, in some ways, a, a praise of modernity itself, a praise of the hybrid, a praise of the artificial as well as the natural. Uh, a relocation of aesthetic value and beauty in a place where you might not give it credit ordinarily. She's performing an act of redemption, and she's also readjusting our, our sense of the aesthetics of the world. This is done in syntax, too, in a way that's remarkably consistent, far more organized than in the O'Hara poem, because you look at, you look at the, the same grammatical structure more or less uh, appears three times in the poem, at least, even if they are artificial, they're red. And then a little farther on, it, you know, in the semi-clean cafe, you know, where they have good lasagna. Once again, there's a qualification. There is a kind of, there is something critical you could say about the cafe. Um, it's only semi-clean, but they have good lasagna. Even that wonderful word lasagna, you can see, in a way, has a, a it has a certain kind of status in the poem. Um, for, 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 for being Italian, for being specific, and for uh, sort of, it holds its own kind of hybridity in the poem, or internationalism, if you want to say. The red is a wonderful joy, really, and so are the people who like and ignore it. In other words, the people in the poem are half-conscious, okay? They like it, but they ignore it. They, give, they, they don't cherish it. They don't assign it any kind of high status. They're not in a museum. These are artificial flowers. They came from the lasagna, not the hygiene. The, these people are unconscious of the beauty that is right next to them. So all of those, all of those uh, different kinds of assertions or elements in the poem, you can see how they have a certain kind of harmonic about the world itself. Impure, hybrid, ignored, human beings themselves, unconscious, inattentive. Um, in this place, they also have good bread. The wonderful humility in the poem, and also this wonderful precision. So do you, you sort of see the reiteration of the subliminal argument in the poem. What a natural seeming poem. This is the, the voice of this poem, um, I just love it. It is so calm, and it does so much work. Um, and again, you see the mind uh, changing direction or at least uh, inserting qualifications along with assertions as it goes along. They are artificial, but on the other hand, they're beautiful. Am I going to despise them because they are artificial, or am I going to love them because they are beautiful? So we have a little, a little dynamic choice in, we're invited to participate in. So, um, so this is uh, similarly a very, very naturally unfolding poem. Um, it's got pretty long sentences. I, I like that myself because they, 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 they weave back and forth, they, they tack back and forth, and I feel that a mind is thinking and feeling in process. So those are features of, uh, of how voice is made. I'll show you another example which, uh, which, um, uh, 
which illustrates a different uh, dimension, I think, of how good poetic voice is made, which is this poem by Ezra Pound um, called The Lake Isle, on the left-hand side of the top sheet. And uh, you might know this poem. Um, I guess that another point I want to make about uh, that, that's visible in the, in the Taggart poem is that one thing, too, about it, it, that, that, that you might notice about the construction of voice is that it, it often includes um, elements of speech which are not carrying any particular information. And there are two moments, at least in the Tiger poem, where that's true. Just the same in the second line. Even if the geraniums are artificial, just the same. Informationally, the poem does not require those three words in order for its information to be complete. The poem could say, even if the geraniums are, are artificial in the rear of the Italian cafe. So you see, that's an element of voice. It has no particular content, but its content is the sensibility and the sort of forcefulness, you know, uh, the insertion of the author. So oddly enough, this runs contrary to uh, some of our sometimes stated aesthetic premises, like the, um, the, the, uh, the, the saying that in a poem, every single word must count. Every single word must perform a function. And yet, the words just the same, and then later in the poem, really, those words are not performing any specific informational function, any obvious function, but they have a lot to do with the propulsion and the thrust and, and, uh, and our sense of the personality and the sensibility behind the surface of the poem. So you'll find that in poems that have a lot of voice, and in poets that, 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 that are able to exert a lot of voice, um, you'll often find, almost like seasoning, like some kind of salt, there are a lot of what you would call um, voice additives. Uh, sort of, for example, or like I always say, or, um, uh, or just the word like. Um, um, so there, we, in, our, in, in our speech, as you can hear from my own um, fairly undisciplined speech, there are so many asides and so many different um, uh, phrases and self-corrections which are merely, in a way, about filling space and sort of registering, keeping the continuity of speech even though they are not pushing the argument forward. Um, a list can be made of, of, such, of such phrases or fragments and if you salt them into your own poem, you will find that suddenly you are embodying a more relaxed speaker who is more colloquial, more idiomatic, and that breeds an intimacy with the reader and an intimacy of presentation, which will not be in your poem if you are a, a strict uh, disciplinarian of, uh, of, of, of grammar and, and speech. They have a kind of impurity. It's like the dirt on the potato. So, um, so it's quite interesting to note the words that do not perform any obvious function and yet are part of, uh, are part of the speaking voice. Um, here's the poem by Ezra Pound, The Lake Isle. Um, and th this is a good illustration of um, the, hybrid, the hybrid combination of, of high, high and low in a, particular, in a very particular kind of form, The Lake Isle. O oh God, O oh Venus, O oh Mercury, patron of thieves, give me, in due time, I beseech you, a little tobacco shop with the little bright boxes piled up neatly on the shelves and the loose, fragrant Cavendish and the shag and the bright Virginia, loose under the bright glass cases, and a pair of scales, not too greasy, and the whores dropping in for a word or two in passing, for a flip word, and to tidy their hair a bit. Oh God, Venus, oh Mercury, patron of thieves, lend me a little tobacco shop or install me in any profession, save this damn profession of writing, 
where one needs one's brains all the time. So there's a kind of richness of self and sensibility. And again, underneath the surface of this very relaxed voice, there are many, many different things going on. Perhaps, um, and, and you feel the intimacy uh, of the speaker, it, again, conceding his own impurity, conceding his, his, his modest but greedy secular desires inside a form which is given to a high, given to a high formal, very old, antique form of prayer, prayer and praise. Oh God. So what we have is we have a high old, highly formal, transcendental, addressed to the gods that you might find in the Iliad or the Odyssey. Um, but what's being carried inside the form or the vessel of that address, which is, again, the container is quite formally constructed, is um, the secular, you know, the profane, the ordinary, the humble, um, the self-interest, you know, the dirtiness of life. In some ways, again, this is a poem about modernity too, where um, prayers, ha prayers have been uh, uh, severely demoted in what we can hope from their results. You know, oh God, you know, give me a Volkswagen, just a few years old, with you know, not a lot of mortgage payments on it, you know, and good tires, at least on the front two wheels, if you will, oh Jupiter, oh God, oh Lady Gaga, oh Adele. So, so a, a, a beautiful hybrid form again, um, and that's probably the most prominent feature of the ways in which it combines, without irony, I think, without cynicism, um, even though there is irony here, um, somehow or other managing to combine both the elevation of the old rhetoric, the great old rhetoric, along with the, the, the humbleness and the pedestrian proletariat nature of the desires of the speaker. Okay? This is a highly effective, uh, this is a highly effective vehicle of the voice. Um, um, it's relaxed in its syntax and yet it's, it's musical. Um, what else to say about this? Well, you know, there are horrors in it and, 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 and there's a pair of scales, you know, which may not be exactly uh, adjusted to deliver justice, but is not at least exploiting the, uh, exploiting the, the clientele too radically. Um, uh, there's a, a, an, an interesting kind of acknowledgement that the poetry itself is, a, is written by a poet and is about the profession of poetry too. And again, that's a kind of confidence that builds an intimacy between the speaker and, and the writer. It's what you could say, it, 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 it opens the fourth wall in theatrical terms Yes, I'm writing a poem now, and yes, you're reading a poem right now. Um, so that combination of informality, again, you see the additive syntax, a long sentence, and, 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 and. You could say what that extended syntax is about, is about you know, the unity of the self, or at least you know, the, the, the connectedness of the self, um, even in its kinds of uh, disunities, or fragmentations, or ironies. Um, There's another uh, dimension I want to point out about voice here, and that would be the dimension of ventriloquism. Um, all good writers of tone and uh, of, of voice, all writers, poets who capitalize on voice, I think are skilled ventriloquists, as we all are. They're highly attuned to the different levels of speech and where they're borrowed from. So you can see in this poem, one transparent act of ventriloquism is that he's channeling this old kind of sacred invocation or request. Right? That's a kind of ventriloquism. He's borrowing from, from one area of culture and in fact one era of culture you know, in order to deliver his, his contents. And, um, and we feel the elevation of the rhetoric at the same time that we know that there's a certain kind of parodic element to how he's delivering it. So ventriloquism is a, a remarkable thing you see um, all the time, and you see it in diction shifts, you'll see it in grammar, um, and uh, anyway, it's a fine poem. Somebody would probably like, like to point out that the poem is called The Lake Isle, 
and that in some ways it's um, a reference to the Lake Isle of Innisfree by Yeats. And, and as you probably know, Ezra Pound was Yeats' kind of highly bossy secretary for a few years. Um, and so he's, again, he's attacking an authority figure you know, by mocking him. Once again, that's a kind of ventriloquism too, isn't it? So there's a, there, dialectic is a word that I like very much, that an alive poem is a poem where the different parts of the self are speaking to each other, speaking to elements outside the poem. Um, I'd also say that, that there are two, there's so many ways to, different ways to read poems. Um, uh, and, uh, and one of them would be psychologically, which is basically the, the, the path I've chosen, is that the self is a community. Um, the self is a loose alliance. Um, but there, that there are struggles constantly going on between the vulgar and the profane, um, between um, the history of an individual, between wounds and wishes, between the present and the past, between um, the superego and the id, however you want to construct it. And when I go through a poem whose voice especially interests me, I circle little areas and block them out, and I say, oh yes, here is this, kind, here is this particular voice seeking to be heard in the community of selves, holding up its hand and saying, wait a second, I want to say something, I want to say something. And then there's another voice that sort of spits at it or kisses it or something like that. And the poem we're going to finish up with is going to uh, include a sort of remarkable Ringling Brothers circus of elements of voice. But before we go to that, so, so ventriloquism, um, the mind, the self-correcting mind in motion, um, a great variety of rhetoric and diction of the idiomatic and of formal speech. You can see all those things in these strongly voiced poems. Um, I'm going to show you um, the, this Louise Good poem is so much fun to read, but I'm not going to read it, even though it breaks my heart. No, I am going to read it. <laughs> I'll just read it and then we'll go on to the Berryman. I really want to get to the Adrian Blevins poem mainly. Here's the Louise Glick poem. Uh, Louise Glick is one of the you know, contemporary masters of American poetry. Uh, I sort of place her at the top of the, at the, top of the ladder along with W.S. Auden. If I, if I was going to give the Nobel Prize to an American poet, um, it would be something like that. Purple bathing suit. This is one spouse addressing the other spouse. Purple baby suit. Now, just experience as I read through the poem, um, the labyrinths, um, both underground and overground, that you're being escorted through. It's really quite something. Purple bathing suit. I like watching you garden with your back to me in your purple bathing suit. Your back is my favorite part of you the part farthest from your mouth. You might give some thought to that mouth. So you see what a complex psychological dynamic is being set up. It seems to be about affection at first, and then the hostility kind of surfaces gently and malevolently into the poem. Your back is my favorite part of you. You get to that line and you think, hmm, does that mean that if it's a male speaker or a female speaker, that you know they, they, they like the person their address is posterior. Your back is my favorite part of you. Or do they mean I you know my favorite view of you is when you're walking away? Or so we read another line into into it, and once again the plot, the psychological plot, complicates the part farthest from your mouth. You might give some thought to that mouth. So you see the, that finger wagging, right? So these are gestures of speech which come, once again, just to, just to go back, you might give some thought to that mouth. You see, that phrase, you might want to think about that, that comes from our collective sociological, psychological development. You might want to think about that. You, know, you might want to think about how, you, how much you tip the next time you're in the restaurant. Um, so, so there's a kind of parental, a parental ghost from, from the id, from the superego, coming into the poem at that moment. And so this is my, this is, this is my assertion, really, that uh, a poem is full of ghosts. It's full of figures that are sort of appearing and dissolving in their dialectical relationship. And now I'll just read through the rest of the poem. 
also to the way you weed, breaking the grass off at ground level when you should pull it up by the roots. How many times do I have to tell you how the grass spreads, your little pile notwithstanding, your little pile notwithstanding. Tell me that's not a sexual reference. In a dark mass, which by smoothing over the surface, you have finally fully obscured. Watching you stare into space in the tidy rows of the vegetable garden, ostensibly working hard while actually doing the worst job possible. I think you are a small, irritating purple thing. And I would like to see you walk off the face of the earth because you are all that's wrong with my life. And I need you. And I claim you. <laughs> a powerfully compressed psychic, you know, psychic codependence, resentment, hostility, and attachment. This is a really a remarkable thing about tone. Not only does it testify to attachments, it also uh, testifies to hostilities and detachments. It incorporates the whole history of feeling and thinking. It's not just about a present moment. We see in this poem, inscribed in the surface of this poem, we see a whole history of a relationship in these subtle nuances and t of tone. Okay. This is another thing about a poem. If you want to read it psychologically, you want to see whether the poem is written entirely from the adult perspective, the so-called integrated, disciplined, mature self, or whether it's allowing the squalling, infant, adolescent, tantrum-throwing, leave the laundry outside your bedroom door, you know, part of the self. You know. If, it's, if, it's a, if the, the child voice, the child voice, the petulant, tantrum-throwing choice, will rise to the surface and take a part in the dialogue in a poem which is a depiction of the full psyche. And when the poem is a depiction of the full psyche, we trust it that much more. At least I trust it that much more. Because I know that somebody is not pretending to have clean hands or unmixed feelings. I only believe in mixed feelings. I only believe in, 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 in assertions when they have sort of dirt stuck to them. We're going to move to the last poem now. This is a poem, um, I'll, I'll, I'll read, you can read it from the, from the last page. I included two versions. One a sort of clean version and the other a highly marked up. This is a poem um, by, um, by Adrienne Blevins, uh, an American woman poet who's published two books. A southern woman writes a lot about motherhood and, uh, and also being a sort of um, Appalachian hit. She writes a lot about in the southern voice, uh, you know. So um, in a way, her poems contain the registers of poverty, of being an outside class instead of an insider class. This is a fantastic poem. You're going to love it. The X Games. Uh, she's a mother of, of three boys. It's a, in that sense, true. The X Games. When Benjamin comes in and stands in the doorway with his hands in his pockets, I think, he's 11 years old and unquestionably maladjusted. I say, you're so beautiful, you should be in Hollywood. And kiss him, kiss him, kiss him. Ben is, in fact, quite good looking despite the six or seven thrasher boys screaming and stomping inside his blood, wearing neck charms that look like dog collars. Yet, isn't it really just Ben standing there? He of the three who, without any papers, snuck inside me during the 1980s when all I wanted was out of my marriage or retarded or departed. That's how angry I was. I don't mind saying, that's how bad the sex was. For now, Ben would just like to say that someone, someone broke his neck trying a backwards double flip on his bike. I've seen it before. The boys coming out all hot and excessive 
like they were born in Wheeling, West Virginia on a bankrupt carnival ride? When I tell Ben I'm writing this poem and need to know the name of the boy who died on his bike, he just looks at me slow and skateboards grinning down to Greenland Street. So I just stand there then and let him go. So, an enormous amount inside this container, an enormous amount of, of voice appended to a fairly small amount of plot, but with a lot of backstory coming in too. So these are really what we, we refer to as the three-dimensionality of poems or the polyphony of poems. So this poem represents all those ingredients of voice I've been talking about. Changing and revising of a mind in progress, the history of feelings and thoughts, high diction and low diction, a lot of ventriloquism that comes from gathering different kinds of speech samples from the far reaches of culture and bringing them into the poem to compose ultimately the picture of a sensibility of who is speaking. So, um, so let's look at it a little bit. The opening, the opening lines of the poem establish a kind of narrative frame. Thank God, because the ingredients of voice here are so strong that they would overpower it if you did not have a basic kind of narrative, a situation in time and space, in the present time and space, to, to append everything to. When Benjamin comes in and stands in the doorway with his hands in his pockets, I think he's 11 years old and unquestionably maladjusted. I say, you're so beautiful, you should be in Hawaii. He's 11 years old and unquestionably maladjusted. Now, where does that speech come from? Well, that's therapeutic, analytical speech. And it is speech that is not actually said out loud. In this little moment, we right away, we have a very strong kind of fraction between what you think and what you say. And of course, what we think and what we say to a person are constantly, sometimes at, at a very dramatic uh, difference between them, right? I think, even, and this is the mother, remember, unquestionably maladjusted. The therapeutic analysis, nothing I can do about that, I fucked him up already. <laughs> you know, but what does she say? She says, you're so beautiful, you should be in Hollywood. And kiss him, kiss him, kiss him. So much is going on inside these two first sentences. So there are several kinds of speech. They're gathered from different parts of the self. They're also gathered from different parts of, of the culture. Unquestionably maladjusted comes from contemporary therapy speak. We've got the, uh, we've got the, the, we've got the, and it's also analytical. Maladjusted is not the, it is not the, it's a clinical way of seeing your own child maladjusted. But what she says is the maternal, hyperbolic, and erotic sentence, you're so beautiful, you should be in Hollywood. Okay? So right next to the analytical view of, of, of her own child, we have this gushy outpouring of maternal love. Um, and those come from very different levels of the self, which do not contradict each other, they coexist. The parts of the self coexist. In, 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 in contradiction, only in apparent contradiction. How about the end of the sentence? And kiss him, kiss him, kiss him. This is gestural speech. The speech is replicating the physical gesture of kissing the child. So this is speech which is being exerted, this is language which is being exerted in a gestural, physical way. It's not about, um, it's not about uh, semantics. It's not about etymologies. It's not about the precise meanings of words. It's about kiss him, kiss him, kiss him. And so that speaks to us on a level of embodiment, which is quite distinct, again, from the level of the mind that says unquestionably maladjusted. So, so much energy going on here, so many different kinds of levels, so much, um, so much polyphonic tonal self, and also just so much knowledge of human nature and of relationships. So that is a magnificent example of voice. Okay, Ben is, in fact, quite good looking. And once again, we see that combination as the sentence unfolds of, you know, of, is, the boy in, is the boy entirely screwed up? Is the attitude of the mother, you know, entirely sort of cynical or, or, or despairing of the child? Or is it affectionate and maternal? 
Ben is, in fact, quite good looking, a statement of allegiance and objectivity, I suppose, common sense. Ben is, in fact, quite good looking. What do those words, in fact, do? Well, again, that's an example of an aside which comes from a uh, phrase that is not carrying information, but, uh, but, is just, but, but tells us something very, very specific in terms of us being read. Ben is, in fact, quite good looking. So once again, this is a third kind of speech or a fourth kind of speech which is coming into the poem in, in a mere four sentences. Despite the six or seven thrasher boys inside his blood, and then you have this elaborate kind of hyperbolic, uh, fabulous metaphor, wearing neck charms that look like dog collars. Yet isn't it really just Ben standing there? Okay, what happens in this next sentence is fascinating. He of the three, who without any paper snuck inside him, he of the three is a formal inversion. It's, it, it, it's an element of formality in what you would say is an entirely colloquial, idiomatic voice in the poem. He of the three. So you see that that has, um, it has a kind of, uh, in, inverted syntax always carries the connotations and the histories of a formal manner of speaking. And once again, this speech register testifies to the erudition and the literacy of the speaker. This is not written by a, a, a hick. This is not written by somebody who is a merely a mother, but somebody who is actually a rhetorician as well. He of the three who, without any papers, snuck inside me during the 1980s when all I want, etc. Snuck inside me. Snuck inside me. Mothers must love this poem. They must love that verb, snuck inside me. It, you know, so, sort of like, it, it, again, it, it provides a not entirely flattering portrait of the speaker. <coughs> because it basically, it sort of implies that if I had my say, that boy would not have snuck inside me. He infiltrated me. You know, he was like an immigrant crossing over boundaries. And now, um, what am I going to do with him? Deport him? Um, so that also that 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 little plot or a bit of implied narrative is also uh, is also represented in who without any papers snuck inside me, and you see this really really ex interesting example of a figure of speech and how resonant it is of things that have nothing to do with poem. He who without any papers snuck inside me. So all of a sudden there's a little metaphor in which immigration, you know, suddenly makes. Uh, suddenly makes its appearance. It never reappears again. It's not a main theme of the poem. It's an apparently extraneous metaphor. But look at how it, rich, how it enriches the poem, you know, in its complexity and in its <coughs> representation of the breadth of the world. Just to use that metaphor is, um, it may be a happy accident on the part of the writer, but again, it just means that there are all kinds of vibrations and information coming into the poem. Um, who without any paper snuck inside me during the 90s when all I want, wanted was out of my marriage or retarded or departed. Again, a very odd moment. Okay? So these different moments and these different kind of tenors and registers, they require that we pay attention to them because they are different types of speech. All I wanted was out of my marriage or retarded or departed. Retarded or departed. So this is a moment of glossolalia. It's a moment when speech is not exactly sort of, uh, it's, it's not, again, exactly semantic. It's a funny rhyme. All I wanted was to be retarded or to be departed. To be departed is to be, is to be dead. To be retarded is not to know what's going on. So there's a, a, a moment of high crude comedy there about the marriage that happens in the past. Once again, we're getting the history of feelings and ideas that exist in the surface of the poem. That's how angry I was. I don't mind saying. See what's happening there? I don't mind saying. Not carrying any information, but building through its idiomatic presence a bond between, an intimacy between the writer and the, and the reader. I don't mind saying that's how bad the sex was. For now, Ben would just like to say that someone, someone broke his neck trying a, a double flip on his back. Again, ventriloquism. All of these can be seen as examples of ventriloquism, of imported speech. The boy is speaking here. Someone, someone broke his neck trying to double fly. So the boy is speaking here. The poem is dialectical. It has other characters speaking as well as sort of other registers and other areas of culture. I've seen it before. The boy's all coming out all hot and excessive like they were born. Once again, an elaborate metaphor in Wheeling, West Virginia on a bankrupt carnival ride. 
When I tell Ben I'm writing this poem and need to know the name of the poem, so what's happening there? Again, the breaking of the fourth wall between the stage and the audience. I need, I, I want to know the name of the boy. You know, sure, it's a tragedy, but I'm writing this poem, and I want to get my poem, I want to get my poem done right, so I need the name of the boy. So there is this selfish, kind of greedy admission, concession, uh, revelation of the impurity of the speaker, you know, and then the boy won't tell him, and then he skates away. The poem ends in a, in a rhyme between slow and go. He just looks at me slow and skateboards grinning down, sh down the Greenland Street. So I just stand there with him and let him go. I guess another aspect of, uh, of a convincing voice is that a poem is not over-finished. A process poem is not over-finished. So this incompleteness, this contamination, this impurity, all of these things, these asides, allowing the full kind of multitude of voices to come to the poem. That's how you make a convincing, dynamic, mercurial, uh, kind of pr propulsive and self-contradicting voice in a poem, which is this amazing charisma that some poems have and that some poems don't. Um, and I really am uh, just about out of time, but, uh, but I think I've said pretty much what I want to say. There are some poets um, who take this voice thing so far that they leave content itself behind. They become so infatuated with the manners of speech as opposed to the substance of speech. These poems are all attached to, to at least minimalistic narratives. But when a poet ventures, becomes, I would say, over-sophisticated or over a feat or over esoteric, what happens is that the speech no longer is stuck to the backing of experience. There's a, a, a brief quote in, the, in this handout from Ivan Boland where she's talking about tone. Seamus Heaney quotes her Ivan Boland. That's where I got it from. She says, tone has to come from the experience of a suffered world. Now, it's not merely a technique. It's not merely uh, a bit of dilettantism or, or, um, or, or um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, uh, virtuosity. Tone is not merely an act of virtuosity, although it is that too. It is a highly sophisticated instrument, but it has to be, the poem has to be attached to this, having lived in a suffered world and having suffered. So the wound should show, not the perfection. In, in addition, the perfection should show too. So Caliban and Prospero exist in the same, in the same poem. A poem is a heroic act of integration, both of the self and of the culture. A poem still has responsibility to unity. Imagine if a poem were disunified. Suddenly, you could find that Prospero was not, you know, uh, was not ruling the poem, but all of a sudden, there was a Caliban in the White House. And that's what <laughs> happens when the source, when the self gets divorced from parts of itself permanently. It pays a very, very heavy alimony. And that's all. <laughs>